Okay, we're ready to start with the next program. And I'll start with introductions with Sean Nevers on the farthest end, and then Carissa Vogel, and then David Armand right here. Sean Nevers is the head of reference at Brigham Young University, which means that he oversees reference facilities, facilitates faculty research, and he oversees the library's electronic resources. He also teaches legal research. And he has several publications, and he maintains the BYU Law Library's blog. He's given several presentations, including AALL, and he's received several awards. Carissa earned her library science degree here at the University of Washington, and then she went to work at Columbia as a reference librarian and head of public services. And now she works at Cornell. She's the assistant director for research, and she teaches legal research. And she also has several publications as well. And then David Armand has an unusual title. He works at Brigham Young University. I just had to tell you his title. Senior Law Librarian and Head of Infrastructure and Technology for the Law School. So that's a mouthful. And, and he's also in charge of our building. We just had a major renovation, which he did last summer. So if you're ever in Provo, come see his work. It's great. Anyway. David has taught legal research, advanced legal research, law library management, and lawyer skills and advocacy. And just to know David's character, I asked him what he, I, I should say about him, and he said, just tell him I'm happy to be there. <laughs> so I'll turn the time over to you. Thanks, Bonnie. Um, to start off this one, this might be a little dangerous because it's getting towards the end of the day, but we're going to ask you to think a little bit with us. And uh, the first thing we want you to do, if you have a cell phone or uh, some kind of device, we have a, a short survey we want you to take, because we're talking about surveys, so we wanted you guys to be part of participants in that survey taking. But if you go to this URL here, um, lawlibguides.byu.edu slash WP2014, there, is, uh, there are some links on the left. If you click on any one of those links, we'd like you to do this right now, if you have uh, your phone or, or whatever you've got, uh, to go in and to just answer the short survey. What it's going to do, if you go into that LibGuides page, there's those links on the left, and there's several different resources. And what we'd like you to, to look at is, is to think, if you were teaching legal research in the first year curriculum, um, or if, I guess if you're teaching advanced, you could think about that as well. Um, which one of those three, which, which three of, I think there are nine, is that how many we have? There are nine resources there. Select three that you would, if, if you had to cut something or de-emphasize something in your legal research class, what would be the first, the top three that you would either cut or de-emphasize from your legal research curriculum? Give everybody just a yeah, couple minutes it, to do that. Do it now. We're going to use our best to, to try to use this. Penny, were you going to say something? Yeah, I was just going to ask you, would you tell those of us who didn't bring devices today what the nine items are so we can actually think of what we would answer the survey if we can't answer the survey? Or will that give too much away? Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll actually get to that. Oh. And so, and, um, but, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll just, okay. we'll get there in about um, Depending on how fast Sean Yeah. Yes. Yeah, we want you. We want you to participate. Okay. Yeah. This is just to kind of get us thinking about um, what kind of things should be should be taught or maybe not taught in academic law libraries. But we would be interested those of you work in firms or government, as you see attorneys. How many of you do again do not work in academic law libraries, just by show of hands? Okay. Okay. Great. Don't, oh, yes.
All right, while you, while you finish that up, um, David's going to talk about that in a minute. Um, I just want to just to begin so we can get, get going. We've got a lot to talk about today. But the topic that we have today that we want to talk about are, are legal research uh, practices of attorneys. And this is a, an area that I've been really interested in in my um, work in academic law libraries uh, as I teach legal research and get, get people ready to go out into firms or into government or, or wherever. And I think um, this is very applicable to, to, I think, all of us. Uh, we want to talk today about um, what attorneys are doing and try to see what kind of things that, how that affects the way that we teach in academic law libraries as we prepare attorneys of the future. Um, really, as a, I've studied this, I mean, the, the literature of our profession doesn't really show that we have done many studies on how attorneys actually conduct legal research. Uh, in 1969, Morris Cohen uh, said that we almost we know almost nothing about the actual procedures used by lawyers in their search into the law. And 35 years later, uh, Dick Danner said, the published literature on the subject suggests that we actually know very little about how lawyers go about their actual research. And there has been, I think in the last 10 years or so, some push by law librarians to begin studying um, attorneys and how they are researching. Uh, just a few I've looked at Stanford Greenberg has a survey where he looked at practices of attorneys. Judith Lee Hosett has written about how she's done interviews with attorneys. Uh, David and I have worked on some different standing focus groups that we've done with attorneys. Recently, Joe Lawson, a county law librarian, has written about a survey he did on how attorneys are doing research today. And what we're going to talk about today is uh, another one that has studied um, practices of lawyers as well as what uh, law firm librarians think of how lawyers practice research. Um, is the Alsys Task Force on Identifying Skills and Knowledge for Legal Practice. That was a survey that was, uh, the chair of that committee was, that task force was Susan Neville Mart, and I was able to participate on that, on that task force. And that survey um, went out, there was two similar surveys where we surveyed uh, practicing attorneys as well as law firm librarians. We got about 600 responses from practicing attorneys from across the country, as well as about 150 um, law firm librarians that participate in this survey. And if you, you've probably, some of you have seen this, um, and you, if you want to just Google it, you can Google ALSIS Task Force Survey, and some of the documents come up there. And what we wanted to do today was really get into some of that information and talk about what it showed and how we could, um, in the academic side, what, what does that mean for us who teach legal research? Um, should it mean anything? What, what could we change? And some of the things, the questions that were asked in that survey, there was a whole section on resources, you know, what kind of resources are attorneys using in their, in their research. Um, we also focused on research process, a lot of things on how you are actually doing research, where you begin your legal research. And then there was a whole section that talked about what are your opinions of how new associates are doing legal research. And we asked that of the, of the attorneys and as well as of the law firm librarians. And, and so we'd really like to just kind of focus on some of those results that we found interesting, some of the things that it might mean for what we do in teaching legal research. Um, I'm grateful for David and Carissa for being here with me. They did not participate in this survey as, as we, um, we designed it and drafted it, so they have more, hopefully more objective views. They can tell us where, where we went wrong in some things because there are some weaknesses of the survey, and we want to go into those, those ideas of you know, are surveys in general a good way to go? Are there other ways that we can look at, um, we can look at law um, attorneys and how they're researching and, and really get good information about how we should teach and what we should do in law, in law libraries? Um, one of the things, before I turn it over to David, I just want to talk about is the question came up as we were doing this and, and some of the other things I've done is why should we care, right? A lot of the comments were, um, Attorneys aren't good re researchers, so does it matter how they're researching because they're, they're not that good at it anyway? Um, should we really pay attention to that? And while I agree that some attorneys are not great researchers, I do think there are a number of attorneys that are great researchers. Um, and, but the thing that I, as I've been thinking about this over, over the last couple of years, I, I think there are several very important reasons for why we should be studying um, attorneys and how they actually conduct legal research. I think when we talk about um, just the information environment and the, how quickly it changes, I mean, the attorneys are the ones that are seeing these resources and deciding whether to incorporate them or not. Um, and maybe they decide to do it, maybe they don't. But the speed at which new resources are coming out, that it's important for us to stay connected, I believe, to the attorneys and how they are actually researching and what kind of research tools they're using in their practices. 
I think especially with the recession as well, when we talk about cost, costs and research, I think that's changed a lot in how, we, how attorneys practice research. And we know that. We've seen that kind of a explosion of um, free and low cost sources, and I think that will continue. But also just the idea that there may be things that we think are the best way to do things that really are maybe cost prohibitive now, or attorneys are finding ways around those and can still get the same types of information. Um, another reason I think is important to study is that when I looked at, you know, there's a lot of surveys out there that look at law firm librarians and how asking them what resources out there, and I think that's great and very useful information. But what I've seen from my own um, law school is we're not putting tons of lawyers out to those firms or um, other areas that have law firm librarians. And so I need to know more of how the smaller and mid-size um, attorneys are actually researching so that I can help my, prepare my students better. And then finally, one of the things that I think is most important is just that when we talk about our, attorney, our students going out and being junior associates, you know, it's the attorneys there that are actually judging the work um, of our attorneys, um, of our new attorneys and our summer associates. And understanding how they're researching and the opinions that they have of our, of our students' research skills, I think is really, uh, really critical for, for us that teach legal research. And so, I mean, none of this means that we have to take everything that they're doing and, you know, and just do what the attorneys do. I think it's, it's, it's a great area that we can explore so that we can decide, you know, what kind of things do we learn from practice that maybe conflict with some of the best practices we may have and kind of do a balance, kind of figure out what is, what is great um, about what they're doing, what is great about what we've always done, and meld them together so that our, our law students are better prepared to practice. Um, I think that when we uh, talk about some of the problems um, that are out there, maybe there are, there are things that attorneys are doing that we don't think are most effective. Well, that's something we learn as we study the practices of, of attorneys. And there may be things that they're doing that we think, well, this may not be the best way to do it. Maybe we can focus as we teach on remedying some of that in law school. Uh, so anyway, those are some of the things that I, I th I'm thinking of, uh, I've been thinking of over the process of this survey about why, why it's so important that we study um, how attorneys do research. And I hope that as we talk today, we can think about some of the weaknesses and some of the strengths. And my hope is that going forward, more of us will study how attorneys are are researching so that we can have a better understanding in this in this information environment that we're in. Let me turn the time over to David, and then we're going to kind of jump back and forth. Uh, so basically, what we're w walking through is sections nine through eleven uh, of the survey, and I don't know has how many by show of hands, how many people have actually looked through the survey? There's one. That's great. Two, three, four, five. Okay, so sold. So. Just tell everyone else. We're going to leave for a while, and you can tell everybody else. <laughs> I, have, I have a paper copy. Yeah, exactly, down here if you want to read it. Um, it's, it's one of these things that when you get a, a large survey, it's, it's really difficult to know what to do with it, other than to read it and say that's a really pretty pie chart. There's basically, in these three sections, 25 questions. So there's 125 responses that you have to figure out how to make it into what, what's called actionable data um, in, in business literature. It's like, what are we actually going to do after we've asked all these questions? And so, and, and one of the things that you find is that there's just a, a limit in terms of um, pretty pie charts when you look at it, what you can do. And so this is just a quick view of section nine. And so basically, as far as I could tell, since I didn't create the survey, it looked like it was trying to get at the distribution between um, the print market and then the free internet and the fee-based. Those are the three questions that they have. And if you look at it, it's, it's kind of hard, at least, to, to see any great trends. The colors are pretty. Um, and that's about as far as uh, I could get just looking visually. When you actually break it down, though, in, in tabular form, you can start getting to see some trends that, that aren't visible um, when, when you're using the pie charts. And then to make it even easier to understand, uh, I developed a method to combine the categories. And so, and I don't know how many are trained in statistical methods, so I will deal with the two of you that are probably in the audience that, yeah. okay, you ready? So here we go. Um, so, so the justification for combining the, the groups is that they're all now three the same distance away. So if you just have three categories, the categories on the bottom and the categories on the top are the same distance from the middle as the middle category. 
The other thing that happens though when you look at that is that it's a lot easier to see a trend. And so, and I'll give you just two examples uh, using this slide. Uh, the, the first is looking at um, how many people still use print resources. And so, and to get there, you can, what we do, would do is combine the um, occasionally and the frequent and very frequently. And so you get uh, over 75%. Um, so, so it's basically three quarters of the people at some point are running the print resources that they're using. There's always a debate on how much time do you want to focus on print. I started teaching in a program that we did print first semester and then second semester we do electronic resources. And um, with, with uh, just an, an arrogance, I decided I'd try and do it just electronically. And then would, I would do the print afterwards, which was uh, epiphanal when someone was wandering down the stacks of reporters and were doing it in print and actually figured out that little n number, number in front of the reporter uh, it was actually a volume, which they'd never figured out, even though they've been doing Blue Book for a semester. Um, but it shows that, that they're not going to, it, it would be an exception to not see print in an environment where they, they work. So it, 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 it's something that you consider whether or not you're going to keep teaching it. The other is that in the far, the lower right-hand corner of the slide, if you see 67%, it just confirms um, that fee-based resources are the most common used by, by attorneys. And there's been motion, and this, we'll talk a little bit uh, later when we talk about the free internet uh, resources of the survey. It's the last section I'll cover. There's motion with Google Scholar, because when this first was done, Google Scholar wasn't very popular, and, and um, Lexis hadn't developed a search system that made it easy to game Google, Google Scholar so you could search Lexis, get charged for the search, but then click through um, using Scholar and actually read the cases that way. And so I think that's, that will drive scholar use for firms that use Lexis, at least the firms we've talked to it, it does. Um, but that's why we, we try and make it easy to we'll see, see the relationships by crunching the two ends. Um, there is, it, it, I'm not the first person to do this, and unfortunately, I, we did see Mitt Romney um, on our way on to the, the, air, the plane. Uh, I didn't body check him though, so that was better than my experience with Mick Jagger. Um, but but it, it's, um, the, the Bain, Bain uh, Consulting Company is the one who actually came up with a, a, a similar approach of combining the low and the high end of a um, Likert scale to try and come up with some type of relevance. And we're going to talk about it um, a little bit deeper as we go down uh, into the next portion of the um, stack. The first thing I just want to say is a disclaimer. I, I've used statistics as a tuning fork. Um, it's just one measure and it's just one note. And you have to decide whether or not you're going to take action or not. Now, the classic example I can give you is those of you that teach, you get your course evaluations, uh, the novice teacher always want to change everything, thanks Krista, um, want, want to change everything um, based on a negative review. And our courses are really small, they're 25, 27 students. And if you have one negative review, that means you may be actually changing something that 24 students really enjoyed and found useful. And it takes time and maturity to start realizing that, yeah, that's what this survey said on this issue on this day, but this is the way that I want to use it. So in all these results, when we talk, we ask more questions probably than we're going to direct definitively. And that's why we want to do that initial survey, and we'll talk about it later after you see the findings. If that changes your mind, you may feel exactly the same way about what you would actually be emphasize. So um, let me just make sure I hit page forward and page down at the same time. This is actually the other 13 resources in beautiful pie chart format. There's only 12 on the page, because uh, 13 would they get even smaller uh, than they are right now. It's really hard looking at these, go ahead. I may be anticipating a future slide, but I'll ask this question. There are two questions. Given that, at least from what I know, using any one of these does not preclude the same individual using another one of these, does the survey let you correlate or determine whether there's a correlation between a given individual using a subgroup of these? And do you ask a question on the nature of which of these would you turn to first? And, and the answer is, is no. That, that at least I haven't seen the full data set, but what I've seen is the reported results. It doesn't look like any, any of the questions were designed that way and the analysis that's done. Basically, you've got a report out in, in these pie chart formats, and then you have a series of 
um, bar charts histograms that will talk about weak significant relationships and that's as far as it and, and, and it looked like from, from the report out that the data set is limited but I don't, I don't know for sure but at least looking at the questions each question is included in the survey so you can read through it I didn't see that you could develop a relationship study at least not yeah not, not the way the questions were asked and so um, and I, you can correct me Sean if I'm wrong we have a, another section that we'll talk about later about kind of beginning research but um they're not exactly correlated with with, with specific. Yeah, we were just looking at sources, and so so basically, when you break it into the the five point linker scale, it's still really hard to get any any type of relationships. When I collapse it down, um, the what I ended up finding if it ever shows up um, is that it's a little bit easier to see. And my my method again is to. I heavily weight the downside because when I'm teaching, I'm trying to figure out what I can take out. I just have too much to cover. And so when I'm developing learning activities, I'm, I'm always have a mind of what can we get away without to cover the time frame. Not that much different than right now. Uh, and so so uh, what I do is I look at anything that shows up in the rarely or never category that is above 50%. Again, this is the idea of weighting the negative. And then anything that's in the, the very... Um, uh, very often, very frequent, uh, frequent, very frequent, uh, above 10%. And the reason I do above 10%, again, the methodology is based on years as a systems librarian. The best features in the world that are only used by me disappear. So if there's not a market share, it doesn't matter that it's the best design ever. Um, the market will drive what the vendors support. And so, but doing that, what this does is it, 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 it lowers us down to nine, and that's why you have the nine. And here, Penny is. A list of nine um, rank ordered, draw rank ordered, just from the the least used uh, to the most in this uh, set. And so you can, uh, they're familiar now because you've done the survey. They're, they're pretty similar. But besides just ranking it this way, the other thing that I I, I want to do is I want to give credit to those that aren't used very often, especially if there's a trend that they are. So if they had very high frequency of of you know using fr frequently or very high frequently or very frequently, what I would do is I'd um, subtract that from the amount that they won't ever use. And so, and then that gives you a slightly different ranked order. And so you still have um, loose leaves at the, the top, and that shouldn't surprise uh, people because they're, they're pretty specialized, and this is a general survey. Um, and then uh, you've got ALR, which kind of shocked me. I'm from a school that were an ALR digest uh, kind of um, bedrock. And then it drops all the way down um, to litigation resources, which is just right above my, right over my cusp of even something that I'd worry about. But this gives you a lot more. There we go. Oh, I'm sorry. This is one that's um, that that we've now subtracted out or given the credit for things that are trending um, a, a little bit more used. And so, loosely services, if you see, is very frequently used more often than. Um, ALR. So, but it's still the, the same, and then it gives you a weighted value of those that that are less used uh, than those that are used. And so, and then from this, go ahead. You got a question? Just a quick comment that um, we are preparing our students not just for practice but also for academia. So it might be that what percentage of your students are preparing for academia? Uh, if you're teaching a 1L, you're preparing them to be a 2L and to be a 3L. Okay. So and so, uh, you know, you might teach law reviews because a lot of the students are going to write seminar papers, whether or not they will use law reviews in practice. You teach restatements because their contracts professor is talking about restatements, even if they won't use it a lot in practice. Yeah, no, and, and I think that goes back to what Sean said in terms of the different reasons. I thought you were saying preparing them to be uh, professors, and, and that, that percentage is a, it's a low order of magnitude. But, um, but yeah, the, the, the issue, um, we're just looking at the results of this survey of practitioners, and so I think keep that as a bookmark as a limitation of this approach. And so, but what I wanted you to do is go back um, to the same Law Lib Guides page. There's a tab that says reflection, and then based on what we just saw here, if you're taking this into account, would vote again and see if that would change. And, and you can vote using that footnote that, you know, I'm not worried about what, what practitioners are doing at all. I'm, I want to concentrate on what would be most helpful for law students themselves. And then we'll, we'll look a little later if we have time at the, if there's any change based on what we see on the survey of what's being used from what we would actually teach. And I think that will raise, I think Sean and Chris will get into this issue 
about what does it all mean? Right? You know, what, what, what do you want to do? Is there a professional responsibility as a librarian that we're going to teach many things that they'll never use in practice? Um, my experience is that class time is so valuable and we probably have one of the, the greatest um, opportunities of, of most law schools, I think any law school in Westpac, in terms of the total amount of time we spend with first year students in class, we, it's about 1.8 credit hours, semester credit hours a year that we get just with um, our law students. And I never have enough time um, to cover what I think that they need uh, to go out in the first year. And, and my goal is actually to make sure that they get a job wherever. And so, but go ahead and do that as we go, and I'll just flip through these. This is the second, the, the second content section of what I was reviewing, and it's the, the actual internet resources, uh, free internet resources. And we can do the, the same thing again by um, crunching it and then sorting it by um, what's actually uh, available. And so, um, and what we see again, and, and again, it shouldn't make you stop having a law library website, but if your incentive or your funding justification is based on how much attorneys use your website, that might not be the best uh, way to go. But this practicing attorneys don't find it that useful. They don't use it very often. The same with law firm websites, nonprofit org sites, and then this is the, the one with Google Scholar. But here's a classic example of the methodology of, of adding the subtraction. Even at the time of the survey, which is about a year after, uh, probably about seven months after um, Google Scholar had case law, you already got 15.7% of people that are using it. So, so to me, that sh indicates a trend. And the reason I like this trend um, is because then legal blogs were, less, uh, were, were more useful to attorneys than Google Scholar. But if you, um, if you give the credit for Google Scholar that's used more very frequently than legal blogs, what happens is um, legal blogs are less used than Google Scholar, which, uh, again, in my experience, um, legal blogs are used a lot by academic faculty and law students love to use them, but very rarely do they find uh, utility in, in trial practice. And so, um, but that's, uh, that, I think I, I get to hand the wand off, right, to you? Yeah, I think, it's, I think it's my turn. Okay, there you go. So. Well, we'll see, right? There you oh, go. Oh, yep, we're in the right spot. Um, so, that was a lot of numbers. Sorry. Thank you, <laughs> thank you, David. Um, so I'm giving everyone a little break from, from numbers, and we're looking at a pretty picture. Yeah. Mary, you have you have incredibly good eyesight. So for the rest of us, we're just going to see pretty spines of books. Um, so I'm going to start talking about um, the section of the survey where um, attorneys were asked where they started their research, and they were given seven different skills or techniques um, where they were going to be starting their research. And um, what's interesting is that just over a third frequently or very frequently basically ask fellow attorneys start with Google, start with a secondary store, start with um, in-house work product, or start with some kind of subject-specific um, practice guide. And Sean's going to talk a little bit more about the specifics um, within that particular data. I thought it was really interesting when I was looking through that the main trend is that more than half frequently or very frequently start um, with a statute, and by far the most, um, over 57% frequently or very frequently start with case law. Now, to me, when I'm reading that, I, I think that's still indicating that we have a really strong um, case law bias um, that's built into the research process um, based on what they're seeing and what they're experiencing in their substantive law classes. So I know that a lot of times with my students, the default is, you know, without really thinking, without doing any kind of research plan or process, they, they think that they have to go to case law first, no matter what the question um, is in front of them, and that bias seems to be carrying um, into practice areas. Um, so there are two other things that I thought were really interesting about this, going back to um, the, the frequency or very frequency of some different uses. One was the, the Google question. So I saw that and I, I looked at it and I thought, okay, now are we going to see some kind of generational divide or some experience divide based on who says that they're never starting with that or who says that they very frequently um, start with that. And based on the, the, the data and looking at it a little bit more carefully, um, we saw that there, there wasn't really a great deal of difference for someone that had 10 to 19 years of experience versus someone having five to nine years experience about when they, they might start with, with Google. Now, 
in, in real terms, Sean and I are, are the same age. We both graduated from high school in 1996. Um, we didn't have the internet um, until late in high school and early in college. So we, we have a framework, and I know a lot of you are, are giggling um, about, about that. I'm sorry, I guess I shouldn't have called us out on our relative ages. I'm glad we did because we were sitting right here trying to figure it out. Yes, yeah. yes. I'm, I'm older than, than Sean. If, if anyone's trying to figure that out, that's, and, and David is much younger than, than us. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, so what I think is really interesting is I know that when, when we started out um, and when we were taught in, in grade school, like we had card catalogs. We, you know, we went from the transition to, you know, little people still learning card catalogs to then having some computer experience to by the time we're entering college now, all of a sudden the internet is becoming more of a reality and it, it wasn't until my um, my last year of college where the, the kind of online syllabus and no paper syllabus became became a reality. So what what it says to me, so we would fall, you know, in kind of the later end of that 10 to 19 years of experience. Um, there's a there's a divide. My, my brother is a couple years younger than me, so he had this very different experience. But we're we're both kind of equally comfortable um, in a certain way of jumping into um, to the Google world or thinking in that particular way. The place that we're still seeing the divide, which probably is going to be pretty obvious to, to all of us, is more when we're talking about people that have 30 plus years of experience versus people that have um, like less than four years of experience. Very few of the people with less than four years of experience reported never um, starting with Google. It was or, or rarely, it was like under 10%. Um, and, and people with the over 30 um, years of experience, over 25% said that they would never start with Google. So that, that was really interesting to me. Um, the other um, really interesting thing for me in this particular data set was um, the, the reporting on using um, in-house work product. Now, I, um, I, I work in New York. I used to work in New York City. Um, and I was very lucky to um, have been with a group of people that met every summer, firm librarians, government librarians, academic librarians. We could all talk to each other about kind of what we were experiencing with our, with our new associates, with our students, kind of changes, trends that were going on. And I, I learned from, um, from my colleagues um, in, in firms and government that they tell their new associates before you do anything, go to the in-house work product. Like, look at our website, look at our resources before you do anything else because then we're only really, you know, worrying about your time. You're not touching, you know, any other kind of, of resource. So when I looked at the data and, and I saw that especially for um, for attorneys with little experience that were work, working in firms that they were never really going there at first, I think, is actually some actionable data um, that those of you that work in firms and, and governments and and with those young associates, there probably needs to be a reinforcement of what it means um, to go and look at in-house work product and why that's important for them and how they can more effectively um, use that. So, and then Sean's going to go. Yeah, I just wanted to more. build off of that as well because one of the, the interesting things that I saw when when I was looking at this is that these are some by charts on um, beginning research, the question was asked, where do you, how frequently do you begin research with a uh, secondary source? How frequently do you begin research with in-house work product? And it was interesting to me to look at these and compare them that really, um, they're fairly similar, I think, in, in, in how the results turned out. And yet, when I think of how I teach legal research, I mean, uh, there's a big focus on you know, beginning research with a secondary source. Um, and I mention in-house work product, but I, I don't really, I haven't developed a way yet to really have that be something that we can practice and do. And so I got my mind thinking about these ideas of how, how could I include that? Because I think that is an important area um, that an important starting point for research, as Carissa has mentioned. And 
Uh, we don't have a lot of time, but I was curious. I mean, I've come up with some ideas, but does anyone who teaches legal research, do you, have you developed a good, uh, good way to um, teach students to begin? Do you have any exercises that you do or any ways that you've created your own databases to simulate this in-house work product beginning with in-house work product? Or any ideas? Yeah, Vicki. Oh, no, I haven't. Okay. <laughs> but I almost wonder if it should be part of a first year curriculum. Sure. Um, and I think uh, I also worked in private firms before coming into the academy. And I do know that in house work product procedures differ from firm to firm. Um, and it's, uh, I think, teaching good core research skills. Uh, will transfer over to using that in-house work product and allowing our colleagues in the private firms to take well-informed students and turn them into well-informed practitioners. So, um, you know, we talked, or uh, one of the speakers talked earlier about what do I cut? Right? We never have enough time because sure. it's so much. It's sure. like we want to transfer our brains into their brains. That's not going to happen. Right. And I think it's more important to reinforce some core skills um, rather than introducing work products that are specific to particular legal environments. Thanks for your comment. Yeah. Would it make sense to have to, in your class conceptualize in-house work product as one subset of secondary sources because they are, in a, in a sense, secondary sources produced by their colleagues at your firm as opposed to a publishing house, but they're not the law. They perhaps more often than not are practical as opposed to a conceptual discussion of the law. But in some respect, it, depending upon how the firm works, they may be indexed or content, table of contents might be similar to some secondary sources. Or they, they might have situations where particular practice areas have particular separate sites that is going to house most of the work products so that if you're in a particular subject area, you wouldn't even know what's going on for another one. Mary. It occurs to me that students are teaching each other to use in-house work product when they uh, create outline banks. And the student bar association, you know, tells the one else, well, here are the outlines created by the two L's. So they are very quickly figuring out the advantages of using what somebody else has done. And they are also learning the disadvantages, that they miss something when they don't do their own analysis. Great point. Yeah, that's right. Last one, then we're going to move on. When, hello. When I talk about forms, um, you know, like you might work at a firm there and they've got all their own form bank there where you're going to use that. And sure. I also sort of come in there and dovetail it with, you know, it's not cutting and pasting. You actually have to read through the stuff and make right. sure everything's correct and all that sort of stuff. But I just touch upon it, but I'm a little surprised at those numbers there. So. Yeah, I, w I, w I was too. Can I just say one thing? Yeah. Um, so. This, this year for our lawyering class at Cornell, we actually separated out um, our research class and its own um, separate website so that all of the resources for our site, uh, and we do a flip classroom, so there are videos and assignments and um, other things that we might add for clarification, all live um, in that one place um, so that the, the sense was we start getting them in the habit of, of looking at the things that are already provided for them before they jump out into the rest of the world to try to find information. I think it's just useful to think about how we can do it. I mean, when I was thinking of possibilities, I mean, I think you could you know, compile a bunch of documents yourself as far as grab some briefs and different things and create a kind of small universe where they could, uh, you know, an advanced class perhaps use that for one of the resources. And I think it's just thinking of, of what might be a, a useful thing to simulate this, I think, would be... Uh, at least for me, it's something that I've been I've been thinking about. So, I'm talking about process. Um, so it, it starts to become obvious which slides are Carissa slides and which slides <laughs> are David and Sean slides. Uh, so the next part was that we asked, uh, or they they asked attorneys, um, how how often um, 
they used specific seven skills or techniques when they were actually doing their research. Um, about three quarters said frequently or very frequently they follow sites and cases. Um, that was by far the most. Um, over half said they frequently or very frequently looked at sites and annotated codes or sites that they would found looking at secondary sources. Um, and just over half um, said that they were still, they were using the index and the tables of contents for, with statutes um, when they were looking at um, doing their research. So I, I think that that, I know that a lot of us um, have maybe switched around some of the things that we've done with teaching now, putting statutes before we are we're teaching case law. Um, I think that that's kind of showing up in, in how um, people are answering this particular question. I think um, this is, this is going to be a really interesting um, benchmark kind of survey because <coughs> things have changed so much, even in a really short number of years with um, with Westlaw Next and Lexis Advance and their platforms and how they work. Um, I know that when I, when I got started um, teaching legal research, uh, the first time I taught it, I was a, I was a TA um, at my law school, and searching for a statute was a nearly impossible thing. I think I had one person who um, was in the legislature in New Hampshire, and they had like the language of the legislator in their head. So when they were trying to search for a statute, it always came up like right away. No one could ever understand what was going on. Um, but for everybody else, it was kind of a useless process, which is why when we talked about going to the tables of contents and, and indexes. But um, it, when, when I was developing um, our, our class materials for this particular year, um, it's not hard to search for statutes um, anymore um, with a lot of the platforms. I mean, we're still going to be using them, I think, for the tables of contents and looking through to see where the statutes play together, but actually some of that, like, basic search functionality, I think, um, you know, we might not be emphasizing it for that anymore. Um, another interesting thing that came up was, um, not unexpectedly, um, 19% of respondents said that they did not actually try to go to the digest and find a topic and key number when they started their research. Um, but a, a lot more people said that they, you know, frequently or very frequently um, would actually use head notes um, and uh, topics and key numbers when they were actually looking at a case. That seems to make sense based on what we see um, with, with our students. Um, it's just frankly much easier to find a case and actually use that to develop um, more information than actually jumping into the digest. Um, and of course, as one would also expect, um, solo practitioners are, are not using the digest or headnotes and key numbers um, very much at, at all. And I think that's probably just a sense of you know where they're going to get their resources. They're probably not buying. Um, the Westlaw subscription or the Lexus subscription, they're probably buying something else. Um, the other interesting thing was um, the terms of connector searching. So that question was asked and um, over a third um, of all attorneys said that they very frequently use terms and connector searching. And um, 60, over 65% said that they frequently or very frequently use terms of connector searching. Now, I don't know about all of you, but um, my approach to teaching terms and connector searching is going up into a little bit of a revolution standpoint in that um, what's happening with the um, West Search algorithm, um, it, it really is, is at a disadvantage if you try to do a terms and connector search on that first level. So we're actually going back to a place where um, we're saying, okay, for Bloomberg and um, and Lexis, even in the new platform, it's fine to start out with terms of connector searching, but actually if you're doing it with Wes, start with the general first kind of overview search and then filter with the terms of connector searching after because the results are just so wildly bad um, when you try to do that first kind of search level with the, with the terms and connectors and we just want to make it a little bit more clear um, for our students, so it's going to be interesting to see what happens. Now, my students love learning about terms and connector searching. Like, they, they eat it up. I don't know if that's true for, for all of you. It's like they've just found this power tool. Like, they, they were using, like, a hand screwdriver, and now you've just shown them, oh, yeah, you could just have 
one with batteries and it works so much better. So I don't think it's going to be going away, but I think we're probably going to have to have a more nuanced approach again for terms of connectors. So Sharon's sure. going to talk about a little bit more of comparison now. Yeah, so one of the, the last section of the survey, and this, uh, I invite you to take a, take a look at this because we're just going to show a portion of it today, but asked uh, the attorneys, and also we'll talk in a minute about law firm librarians, what, what are your opinions of um, new associates research skills in a couple different categories? And there are some, if you look at the survey, I, I didn't get into the, the, the I think it's uh, the good side of it. Um, they say that, you know, new attorneys are researching well in statutes and cases and citators. But what I thought might be interesting to look at is if we look at what they say that um, new associates are researching at the level of unacceptably or poorly, um, I've selected the last, I think, the, the top ten in that area. And you can see that, I mean, probably similar to what we would think, uh, legislative history, administrative decisions, I and mean, all these things um, are pretty high in the unacceptably um, to poorly range. Now, one of the things that this survey, as I looked at these results, didn't get at, and, and it was a weakness of this survey, and, and I, th I hope that some of us can explore this more, it was just the idea that when you look at legislative history, yeah, almost 50 percent, that's, that's bad. Uh, but we didn't get into the point of how often do you do legislative history work, right, which is an important consideration. And I think that's something to explore more, especially the same thing with administrative decisions, right? That's something that's probably more specialized or maybe they have other people doing that. Um, but that those are some of the areas where um, attorneys are saying that it's not, not very good. Um, but, I mean, there's some other things when we talk about cost-effective research. I mean, that's something... You know, I think we can always do more in that area. We, Chris and I were talking about it last night where some court and government and firm librarians have said, try not to, not to teach that because every firm is so different. And I, I believe that. We have to make sure that people, the students understand that every firm is different, every environment is different. But I, I do think there's different ways that we can um, encourage them to be a little more conscientious about what they're doing that... Uh, you know, help, help them understand that law school is a place to practice so they can get better at their research skills. I, I've, and a, if, if you're interested in this, you can always help me talk to the vendors about this, but I, I've always been interested in getting Lexis or Westlaw to allow us to have kind of a limited um, information environment where we could have just cases and statutes for the students for a particular problem instead of the whole universe that we get in law, in the law school environment. And I think that that would help us kind of say, okay, in this, in this situation, this is the information environment that we have do the problem, right? And so they get used to kind of seeing the limitations that they have, um, whether it's costs, whether it's, you know, using only free resources, whether it's using a limited version of Westlaw or Lexis. And I think that that would be a, a, valuable, a valuable research tool. So let's move on to perspective. Yeah, so um, I was thinking when I was reading over the comparison between you know, how attorneys are saying that their young associates are doing research and, and they're being much more happy generally than librarians, the new associates doing research. And I thought this actually really demonstrates um, the perspective that I have as um, a, a research instructor who works with a writing instructor in the course of a lawyering program. Um, so to illustrate this and think about this a little bit more carefully, I'm going to tell you a short story. Um, so I had a student, we're going to call him Joe, his name is nothing close to Joe, um, and he came to me when he first got the open memo problem and he was a wreck. He didn't really know what the problem was about, he didn't know what he was supposed to start researching, he, his plan, um, as, as far as I could tell, um, was to Google a little bit and then hope to find some um, case law citations and then start writing because um, of course it was late in the process too. Um, and you know he hadn't remembered about going to secondary sources. He didn't think about whether there, were, there needed to be a statute. He just had no idea what to do and, and no idea what questions to ask. And we met probably I would say four different times um, and I know he also met with um, the teaching assistants in the class because they would come to me and say hey what's going on with this guy and so we we kind of paired up and we're talking with him a little bit and a lot of times what what we would end up doing by the end of my our sessions Joe and I would be like kind of going through and clarifying 
what it, what it was, like ask the questions, what it was that you had to find out, what you were looking for? Did you have to look for someone else for clarification or did you actually have to go and do some research yourself? Um, and of course, so I'm seeing it from that perspective. Um, at the end of the term, uh, the writing faculty member and I talk about the various students and we rank them. And we had one place where we just didn't agree. Um, I had Joe really low and she and Joe was her top person in the class. And we, we started talking about this a little bit more and she said, well, he found all the right cases um, and he had by far the best memo um, and he, you know, he just seemed to know what was happening and not only am I going to give him the best um, grade, I'm also going to ask him to be a TA um, for, for next year. And I'm thinking about this and I'm like, okay, because she wasn't, Jolene, we'll call her Jolene, Jolene wasn't there. Like, Jolene didn't see what I saw when this student was coming in, had no idea how to do a research plan, had no idea how to construct something, didn't really know what kind of questions to ask, didn't have a sense of the secondary sources. So when I was reading through the, the results from the firm librarians and the attorneys, it wasn't necessarily as I was looking at, well, who's right or wrong, but man, they must see these people in very different kinds of situations. Um, and probably have a little bit different set of expectations based on all of that. So it just made me kind of look at that data and think really carefully about like what my expectations are and what my end game should be um, when I'm looking at you know designing the various classes that, that I teach and, and what I should be expecting um, and, and you know what's what's right, like not what's ideal what I think might be the best, but what's what's a realistic place that I that I feel like all of those students need to be. To go along with that, I, I just pulled out a few of these slides and one of the parts that in 2014 the, the task force released a survey that compared the opinions portion of the law firm librarians and the attorneys and the, the, the answers were wildly different in, lot, in, in many different ways and these are just a few of them um, where we talk about attorneys and librarians, um, how they viewed the research skills, this is one ability to research statutes. Um, able to research legislative history, we already know that the attorneys thought that they didn't do a very good job um, and the librarians thought they did even worse, um, <laughs> which makes sense, right, if you've dealt with anybody um, like that. Ability to use secondary sources, again, these big, big differences, um, and even this understanding the difference between statutes and regulations, I mean, over 50% or exactly 50% of the attorneys said they do great at that and we, we thought otherwise. and. <laughs> Um, I don't know if I have another one or not, but uh, I think that, that might be the end. But um, it was interesting to look through this, and I think as Carissa mentioned, we just talk about, we were thinking about expectations, right? What, what are the expectations that we have, and how do we view the students? And that was, as I was thinking, I thought it, it's really important to, to come up with, uh, you know, learning outcomes for our class. Where do we want the students to go? What, what is it that we want them to achieve? Do we want them to achieve... Um, to be researchers like we're researchers, do they have to just get to the level that the attorneys will accept them? Is there somewhere in between? Um, I think there's a push, obviously, in AAAO now on having um, legal information literacy standards. I mean, is that where we need them to get at the end of the course? So I think it's an interesting thing to think about, about how we view the research skills of, of, of these new attorneys or of our law students versus what the attorneys think and where where should that come out after a first year, after advanced legal research class? It's something I think we need to, to be aware of and be thinking about. Um, David, I don't know if you had one. Oh, close. I do, but do we want to talk about the, oh, yeah. Um, yeah. the data first? Well, we can. I mean, that basically, the, the, um, the great thing about the data, uh, having two surveys, it shows how you can invalidate any survey. And the first is by having a small survey size and not having the same people participate. So. Uh, Thanks for the 17 who started and the um, 12 who did it a second time. Mm -hmm. uh, but basically all, all we saw is that Mary is very persuasive uh, in, in her advocacy. <laughs> uh, the um, loose leaf still stayed at the top of the list for most likely to be um, deleted. Uh, case uh, digest moved up one position to be more likely. And transactional uh, um, resources actually moved down one below. And then the restatements uh, and legal encyclopedias stayed right where they were. 
but uh, ALR and law reviews were less likely uh, to be removed from the curriculum and um, then sample legal forms and litigation resources were more likely uh, to be removed. So there, there is some movement based on the survey and my guess is if we surveyed again in about 10 minutes it might move uh, another time. So do we want to ask them at all why they might have changed or if they... Yeah, anyone, did, did anyone change or, or did anyone know of anybody that changed so that way you're, you're not put on the spot. But if anyone that changed the response, um, does anyone want to uh, explain why they felt um, moved to change it the second time that they vote? Like what, what, what metrics were important to you? Because it, it, it clearly, uh, it can be the comments that people hear, it could be looking at the data. And so, um, but I'm just wondering if anyone has, is willing actually to share why they would vote different the second time. Or why their neighbor voted differently. Yeah, uh, or a certain person, an identified person. So. No brave soul today. All right, one brave soul. <laughs> so so I, I, I'll just conclude. No brave souls. Go ahead. I'd like you to talk about what you said about Westlaw Max, that for some reason Boolean doesn't seem to work on Westlaw Max. Can you clarify your statement about Westlaw Next and Boolean not working on the first level compared to other services? And is that what you were saying? Yes. So and why? The, the West, West, well, I don't, I don't unfortunately know a great deal about the West algorithm because none of us do. Um, but we, um, we were actually um, starting to just test our particular problems just to see what would happen um, running the same search in all of the different systems. And um, the, so the West search algorithm that powers behind that first kind of search box on, on West, um, the, the results were, were not what was expected and actually not what they really should have been. If you did a, terms, a pretty developed terms of connector search on that first level. So based on the t our testing that we did of that, the, the way that we're actually teaching our students to work with um, Westland Next is to do a, a more broad search kind of up at that top level and then when you want to get into more specifics use the filtering once you get a result set um, and then put in the Boolean. Well, are you saying that a, like a slash P then wouldn't necessarily find things in the same paragraph? What part of the Boolean is breaking down? I think what she's saying is in the master set, this is an information technology general problem, in the master set that you get returned that the sub-filtering that you do before you execute your search can actually decrease the, the um, precision of what the results are on the second page, or it can increase the precision on, on that uh, immediate hit list that you get, where you're not seeing what you would expect someone to see right off the bat. And so, and, th and that's why you're just running into a collision with all the pre-sort filterings that, that Westlaw is trying to do on the side and then how it's trying to build its rank order. And so you can compete against that if you don't know what it takes into account when it does it. By terms of connect search, or say you're searching a field that is a, has a, if their solar index is actually deprecating that field, but you just increased it, you can cross cancel it out. So a resource that would appear, say on line 10, won't appear until line 60 or 70. And I think that's, that's the behavior that, um, and you can, you can do this even on Google. Google has the same problem that if you try and game Google and you use advanced search features, that you can get actually a very different result set than if you just take out of the box and type keywords. So. But you can set it so the black is the normal Boolean searching. There's a set. You can you set it for the first level. You can go into advanced search and you can do that. And you, you can set it so that we will automatically be advanced search. Right, but, yeah. but that's probably not something that we're going to have our students, you know, our first year students do right away. Um, you know, the best thing is like knowing what they're, what they're going to be comfortable with and then knowing what's happening with the, with the algorithm. Let's give you the best tools to, in order to particularly do that. And, and the issue is when you've got three competing search engines and two of them do it a different way than the other, it's easier just to note the difference and then to tell them that there's ways around it. But it takes a a long conceptual distance to explain that, oh, West has a very, you know, th this proprietary search algorithm and its filters work different, say, than Westlaw, and, and then they both work different, and, but then Lexus, and they both work different than Bloomberg. So and I think that that's why the, the easiest approach is just to say, we, we discourage you from doing it now. You'll learn this tool later as you go. We'll start with this as a basic, and then you can fine tune it later. And, and it's actually, the, the tricky part of doing that is that 
none of these algorithms are fixed, so they're still they're still being tuned. And so so it's what I'll, I, I, we we have we have a library staff, the main library, that's constantly playing with our our solar tuning. And so you just have to get used to the fact that oh, this search doesn't have the same results as it did the last time I, I right. searched it. So. And the last time I searched it might have been two days ago, okay. and there's just different results coming back. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. And so that's one thing that you can teach students right off the bat. Yeah. You put a little thought ahead of time. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then if you know, it's like I'm testing the algorithms, but I found that if you do a terms and vector search that is within the same paragraph, that's about what the algorithm itself is doing. If your search yeah. terms and connectors is any narrower and tighter than that, yeah. then you're tighter than the algorithm. Yeah. Thank you. Any other? Okay, so there's just one more thing we are kind of going to get into, which is the idea of what what we could do to um, to test um, to to look at things in a, a little bit um, deeper level um, and not necessarily relying on someone reporting what what it is that they remembered that they did or what they think they did or what they know is the right thing to do and that's what they're going to put on the survey rather than what they actually do. Um, so that's actually using some of the technologies that we that we now have available and thinking carefully through the way that we could design um, some some tests to actually see the behavior as it's happening in in real time. Um, you know, give a, a particular problem. Um, you know, obviously do your um, background in figuring out where the groups are. And, you know, making an open universe, maybe divide devise a constrained time frame but actually watch um, and, and be able to see what people are doing, what sources they're going to, and where their eyes are going when they're looking at this is just an example of a, of a heat map um, of tracking where people's eyes are when they're looking at a particular site. So there, there are ways now that, that we can devise things that weren't necessarily even available, that we don't have to rely on someone reporting what it is that they think that they do, but actually watching what they're, what they're doing in a particular time and space. And, um, you know, you could, you could confine the space, like Sean was talking about, with a limited um, set of resources. Um, you could leave it wide open, but I think that those are the places, and that's where we probably want to be thinking now, um, is how we can be studying the actual behavior as it's taking place. Um, in as real um, a way as we possibly can, and we're we're way we're way over time, um, so I'm. We're only five minutes, or based on the ten minutes we gave based for the express on, based on the ten minutes. We're happy to answer there. any questions, or we can finish and get into our break. So. And while people are formulating their questions, I wanted to thank everybody at Westpac. I'm obviously not a, a Westpac person, being from New York, um, and I also wanted to thank Sean and David for. Um, for inviting me, so they're they're very kind. Questions? I know a lot of times I think announced. Oh, we have a question. No, I think we're good. I think so. Thank you, thank you, everyone. Thank you.